If you looked at the slide deck, we have a lot to cover today. We have 285 slides for one lecture. It's, uh, it's going to be, some slides are going to be faster paced than usual, but uh, I think we'll make it work. Today we're going to look at implicit models slash generative adversarial networks. Here's the outline of things we're going to cover. Um, some things in more detail than others, but uh, for everything you'll have the reference on the slides. So we'll start with some motivation and a definition of implicit models. So this is a tweet from a few years ago, Ian Goodfellow, the inventor of GANs, um, tweeted this to showcase the rapid progression in quality of generation, quality of samples generated by GAN models, started in 2014, just four, year la four years later by 2018, was much higher resolution, much higher quality generation along this single line of work. Um, big GAN 2018 was one of the big, um, big kind of coming of age moments for GANs because it was DeepMind training a much larger GAN than had been trained before. And as a consequence, the generations were yet so much better than they had been before and really established GANs at the time as the uh, prevalent uh, image generation method. In fact, I went back to the 2020 lecture, and in the 2020 lecture we say something along the lines of, all image generation today is done with GANs. <laughs> <laughs> that was a correct statement in 2020. Um, all the other methods were kind of, you know, promising and interesting, but were not used for image generation. Now, today most image generation is done with diffusion models, which we'll cover next, next week. Um, but um, GANs can also generate really good images, and we'll look at that today. And um, in fact, once we look at diffusion models, you'll see that part of these diffusion models actually use uh, a GAN under the hood. Um, and the Google's mobile diffusion that came out just uh, two weeks ago also uses a GAN to dramatically speed up the ability to uh, generate images. So GANs are still quite critical, even they're not the you know, one-stop shop for image generation, they are a pretty important component in some of the best image generation today. Now, this is one of the funny things that happened with GANs. Um, of course, at the bottom there is the equation that is behind GANs that we'll cover in detail soon. It's also the signature of this image. Um, that was generated by somebody who then sold it at Christie's for you know, the first AI visual art that was sold, and they made a good amount of money. They did not invent GANs. They did not write the code to do this. Um, they did collect the data uh, of that style to then train in that style that might you know, be good to sell at a traditional uh, art auction house, and they succeeded, so pretty cool. So, so far in this course, we've covered autoaggressive models, flow models, latent variable models, all have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, all three of those actually have a common aspect. They're likelihood-based models. You're optimizing the log prop of your data. Um, today, we're going to look at something a little different. So, what we like from a generative model is ability to sample, evaluate the likelihood, to train them well, and to have a good representation. Um, but with GANs, kind of the starting point, even though we will get some of the others as we progress through the lecture, the starting point is what if all we care about is generating good samples? And let's worry about the other things another time. Let's focus on generating good samples. Well, the simplest solution of high quality samples is you just load in your data set, you randomly pick an image from your data set, and it's a high quality sample of the same quality as your data set. Um, of course, that's kind of a no-op. That, that doesn't really give you a generative model that allows you to create anything new. But if all you care about is high-quality samples, in some sense, this is enough. So we've got to be careful we don't fall into this corner case as we uh, try to create a good sampler. So you don't just want to sample the exact data points you already have. Um, you want to build a generative model that can understand the underlying distribution of data points and smoothly interpolate across the training samples. All right, I'll put samples similar, but not the same as the training data samples. I'll put samples representative of the underlying factors of variation in a training distribution. For example, maybe for some people, you see them up front. Another person you see from the side. 
And maybe an interesting sample would be the person which you only had an image from the front, now you get to see from the side, because that means the model understands that things that you've seen from the front could also appear, in principle, looked upon from the side. Um, or maybe in digits, um, you have a bunch of handwritten digits, and maybe one of the digits is always written with a thin uh, pen or something, but the others have variation in thickness, so maybe you understand that, oh, maybe this other digit could also have a variation in thickness, and I can start generating that. So you'd hope that somehow the sample generator understands the factors underlying the generation, and they can generate different versions of uh, what's in your training data. So in implicit models, the, the ones we're going to cover here, we sample Z from a fixed noise source distribution, uniform or Gaussian. That should look pretty familiar. And then we pass a noise through a deep neural network to obtain a sample X. Um, flow models, VAEs, were set up the exact same way. What's going to be different here is that we're going to learn the deep neural network without explicit density estimation. So we're not going to try to find a neural network that maximizes the probability of the training data. We're going to do things a little different. So in an implicit model, given our data distribution, um, and in fact not the data distribution, given samples from our data distribution, x1 through xn, we try to uh, build a sampler, let's call it q phi, which turns z into a sample, where z comes from some prior that's easy to sample from. And then this q phi z will introduce a density, uh, which is density of our model in x space. Um, we're not going to make the assumption that we can evaluate p model in any way. With flow models, we're able to evaluate it. With VAEs, we're able to evaluate it. Aggressive, we're able to evaluate that. Here, we're not making that assumption. It can be any neural network that turns a noise, essentially, vector z into maybe an image. This image is, is what we're trying to generate, or maybe speech, maybe text, and so forth. Um, so we're going to not have an explicit form for these, for these uh, distributions. But we still want somehow them to be close. That's our goal. And so, as you can imagine, we somehow have to find a way to, by looking at the samples that are generated, tweak the Q5 such that the samples look like they could have come from the data distribution, because that would mean the two distributions have gotten close. So we have to measure that, the distance between P data and P model, even though we don't have an explicit P model. So we can't just look at this directly because it's just not available to us. So the original GAN by Ian Goodfellow and collaborators, actually the backstory, even though we're short on time, I gotta tell the backstory, Ian invented GANs in a bar. He was working on other unsupervised learning techniques and they were just generating all these like fuzzy images and it occurred to him, wait, even a neural network can realize that this image is fuzzy and not look like what is in the data, the training data distribution. So why can't I just use that neural network as a feedback mechanism to then train my generator to generate images that look more realistic? Um, so that's a high level idea. This is Ian. Um, he did this work while he was a student at Montreal. Um, from there he went to Google, then went to OpenAI for a bit, went back to Google. Um, this GAN paper has a lot of citations. I just grabbed that a couple of days ago, the screenshot from Google Scholar. If you had written that paper, just that paper alone would have gotten you over 70,000 citations. It's hard to get to 70,000 with all your papers combined, but you write the correct paper. Um, <laughs> you can get it done in, with one paper, you know? Just one paper is enough. Um, now, Part of this is that it's so successful. Part of this, as you'll see through the lecture, is that actually GANs are not so easy to get to work. So there's a lot of follow-up work coming up with ideas of how to make it actually succeed even better and better. Um, because just out of the box, it's, it's not all the way there. So yeah, I guess the key idea is here. You write a paper that is the first one in its category with a lot of room for improvement, with the right idea for many people to build upon. And to tender a Malik will add to that, either you write that paper or you write the final paper on the topic. So everybody can decide that this problem has been solved. Those are the two ways. You write the first or the last paper on, on a topic. That's, that's the best strategy. It's not easy to do. I guess the best lofty goal to have. So this is the equation that's going to matter 
For this lecture, we'll see variations on this, but this is the foundation of what a GAN model is. We're going to train two neural networks, a network D and a network G. G stands for generator, a network that generates images, let's say, to make it concrete. In this class, will essentially all be images. And D stands for discriminator. Discriminator takes in an image and discriminates whether it's an image generated by the generator than well an image that came from the training data. So let's first look at the discriminator's ob objective. The discriminator is trying to maximize. There's two terms. The first term says expect, expected value, essentially when I sample from my data, my training data, log probability under the discriminator. So I want this to be a high probability. So my discriminator, think of it as some neural net that at the end outputs a sigmoid effectively, a probability between 0 and 1, saying how likely it is that this sample was coming from the training data. And so it's going to try to put a 1 on this, on the output, whenever it's from the training data, which will maximize this log, because if it's a probability coming out of discriminator, 0 to 1 is the range you have. So I'll try to, you know, this, this will strive to 1 on data from our training distribution. And then on the other end here, the discriminator is acting on generated samples. And again, the whole thing is being maximized, but there's a flipped sign here. So actually, here it's trying to drive things to zero. And it's trying to understand that that is a generated sample. So a good discriminator will assign a zero probability on the output to a generated sample and a one probability of being real on a training data uh, sample. So that's the discriminator's job, is just training a standard classifier. So there's nothing else going on, just a standard image classifier with two labels, that's it, real or fake. Um, zero essentially is the fake detector, and one is for real. Okay, that's the discriminator, and as you see in the pseudocode, that's all it does, you just train a classifier, that's all there is to it. How about the generator? The generator only participates over here, what does it do? It's trying to minimize this objective. Um, okay, what does that mean? It's essentially working against the discriminator. It's the simplest way to think of it. The discriminator is trying to drive this down to zero because that'll, that'll satisfy its objective as well as possible. But the generator has the flipped objective. So it's actually trying to drive, the generator is trying to drive this to one. Not its own output, but the images it generates, it wants the discriminator to think they are real. And the better it does that, the closer it'll drive this thing up to one as a, as a discriminator will not be able to distinguish from the real images and that way um, it'll optimize its objective. And so a way to think of this is essentially what you have here is you have, and um, when you train a generator, the generator generates image, gets fed into a scoring system which happens to be called a discriminator and then you try to maximize your score. The discriminator tries to work against you, but once the discriminator is fixed, you've already trained a discriminator, let's say, the generator is just trying to get scored as well as possible, make things as real as possible. Now you can imagine this is a game theoretic setting, so once the discriminator is fixed and the generator starts generating things, at some point the discriminator might want to change their mind and say, like, it looks like the generator generates things like this, and you need to train these both in some kind of synchronization to make this work out. Um, so there's some complications here and, you know, at some point maybe discriminator is doing better, sometimes generator is doing better and so forth. Now, at the equilibrium, because that's one way to think of what you're going for here, when you have a min-max objective, you try to maybe achieve the equilibrium. At the equilibrium, um, what happens is the generator will generate images that are indistinguishable from the real data. And the discriminator, the best thing it can do when everything is 50-50, it can't decide, is to also output a 50-50 on its output. So that is the equilibrium of this particular formulation. Discriminator ends up at 50-50. Generator generates exactly what is indistinguishable from training data. Now you might say indistinguishable from training data. You know, aren't you then generating exact copies and so forth? That's in some sense where some choices come in, right? 
this discriminator will not be something that can memorize the training data. You don't want it to be able to memorize the training data. You want it to be a neural network with you know weights that are in some sense capturing the essence of the training data, but don't literally memorize the training data. And that's how you end up with success, really, is that from the viewpoint of the discriminator, it can't distinguish between real and fake. And another way to think of it is that the way you design a discriminator determines you know, what that equilibrium could look like that you end up at. If you design the discriminator as just a memorizer, then you just end up with repeating the training data for the generator, but that's not what you want. But if you do something more regularized in your discriminator, you end up with something much better. Any questions about this equation? Okay, let's see what we can do. Um, so this is what it looks like um, in some sense pictorially as you're training. Here, you're training, you know, you have the generator is here and then the discriminator is here and here. Um, and since you have two pipelines, you have the fake data pipeline this is real, this is fake, pipeline, and both go through this pipeline, both hit the discriminator, but the fake only interacts uh, or gets generated by the generator. Pseudocode, okay, you sample some noise, you then um, generate some data with the generator from that noise, and then you update the discriminator to be maximally good at classifying, distinguishing between fake and real. Then, for your generator, you again uh, sample some noise, you feed it into the generator objective, do backpropagation, and update the weights such that what you generate from that noise is, according to the current discriminator, considered more realistic than it was before. So that, in some sense, it looks simple, but in practice, that game theoretic equilibrium can be pretty hard to achieve and that's where a lot of the uh, challenges come in. Um, shall we do this? The internet connection, internet connection seems pretty bad in here. Let's see what it is doing. Yeah, I don't think we have good enough a connection to, to look at this demo, so you can do that. Um, at home if you want, but essentially it visualizes in 2D how the training of a GAN can proceed, discriminator and generator evolving over time, decision boundary for discriminator and where the samples are generated by the generator um, shifting over time. At convergence, in simple examples, what you'll see is that the generator will drop the points in that 2D space roughly in the region where the training data is also situated. These are some samples from 2014, 10 years ago. Um, MNIST digits, um, faces. Um, I think this bottom left is CIFAR, and this might also be CIFAR, or maybe some kind of heavily downsampled other thing of ImageNet. Um, so this was at the time very promising looking. Right now, this doesn't look super sharp. Um, you're like, okay, well, that's, that's not a great result. <coughs> compared to state of the art today, but at the time, this was looking much better than anything before. And you'll soon get some intuition as to why. Now, how to evaluate? Evaluation for GANs is still an open problem, actually. Um, and part of it is if you just look at the objective, right? Remember how I described the objective? At the equilibrium, you have this weird state where the discriminator is like 50-50, and you're supposed to generate things that look like your training data, but what does it even mean? Like, it, there's not a likelihood-like score that tells you how well you're doing. It's just an equilibrium. So you don't get a score out the way these other models have great log prop scores to, to understand how well they're doing. So what are some alternatives to evaluate aside from eyeballing the results? In the early days, when things were still done in lower dimensional spaces, because um, there was less compute, um, people often looked at kernel density estimators as a substitute for um, likelihood. What do you do there? Essentially, a kernel density estimator says, if I have some samples, for example, in 1D, I have a sample here, here, and here, you blob a Gaussian around it, and you then say, my distribution is the average of these Gaussians. That's what this thing does. Um, 
So if all you can do is generate samples, you can say, I'm just going to generate a bunch of samples and then drop Gaussians around them. And that's my density. And now I can evaluate the log probability of my training data or even maybe my validation data under that density that my samples are creating. And so this way, you, after training again, you have a sample generator, you use a sample generator, take the samples, Gaussian blobs around it, and then you can go evaluate the log prop of your original data. Um, the width of the window you take can very much influence what you end up with. A wider window would make it smoother. A narrow window would make it more bumpy. Um, in 1D, it's pretty easy to eyeball what the right width is to get a clean result. In higher dimensions, you're probably going to have a harder time um, doing that, but you could maybe run a cross-validation over different widths. You could say, I take a range of uh, standard deviations, I try all of them and see which one does the best, and then just run with that as what I supposedly have as my density. Um, at the time, adversarial nets were actually doing quite well um, compared to some of the other state-of-the-art models at the time, so in low dimensions this was actually giving some decent scores. Later, as people started digging a bit deeper, just a year later, um, start realizing that the problem is that as you keep sampling, um, it seems that you somehow don't really fill the space. This is a, a case where they know what the ground truth log likelihood should be if you perfectly train something. And they see that if they keep sampling from their trained GAN, they never get close to it. They keep very far away from it. So putting these Gaussian bumps around your training data is not getting the job done. Now, one way we already know this from a previous lecture is that if you put a Gaussian bump around an image in image space, in pixel space, you put probability mass on a lot of things that are completely unrealistic. So you can never get a super high log prob because you're spreading your probability too thin across things that are unrealistic just by definition of putting that Gaussian around the things you generated. So people came up with something else called inception score. This happened another year later. Um, so the idea was good generators generate samples that are semantically diverse. Because um, that was a big part of the problem. GANs would, because of the discriminator forcing function, would generate realistic looking images, but sometimes they would be very similar to each other. The diversity would be too limited. So that means you're not covering the data distribution, you're just covering a few data points effectively that you're very similar to. And so a good way to then evaluate whether your GAN has done well in terms of capturing the diversity in the data is to look at um, essentially, and this one people were training on ImageNet, um, look at the classification labels, right? So you train your GAN, you generate samples, and then you run an ImageNet classifier. And in this case, it was an ImageNet classifier called Inception, which is a specific ImageNet uh, classifier network. You use the Inception network to classify the generated samples. And if the generated samples get correctly classified, that would be great. But now you have to go in and inspect. So that's, that's not ideal. So as a substitute, what people said to make this automatic, let's just see if the classifier is confident about what class each sample is from. And so if each sample that was generated is confidently classified as one of the thousand ImageNet classifications, then it means that the GAN is generating images that are not some weird interpolation between different classes, which you want to avoid, but actually generating clear uh, images belonging to clear categories. Moreover, if a category is missing, it will also give you a bad inception score. You can have some category completely missing that drops your score. So what this ensures is that you have coverage across all classes, at least assuming the inception classifier is reasonably accurate. You then it means you have coverage across all classes, and um, when you are in a class, you're confident about it. Meaning that you had a really good representative of that class that you generated. Okay, there's some little derivation here. Given we have 285 slides to cover. I'm let you go to that derivation yourself, but you got the main idea. And so what people would then do is they would also eyeball it. They would say, let's eyeball it and also look at the inception score and see if the inception, core, inception score improvements align with our eyeballing happier, being happier about some uh, certain GANs that we trained. And so one thing you can actually also do is you look at real data. Real data has an inception score of 11.24. 
Um, our methods, this is a, a GAN paper at the time, 8.09, so not exactly where the real data is. So this means there's likely still a good amount of room for improvement on the GAN that was trained in that paper, but it's doing better than some previous uh, unsupervised learning methods for image, image generation that were state-of-the-art at that time. Now, one thing um, that you can do, you can say, hey, actually, if you, if you literally optimize for the inception score, there's still a bug in it, meaning that in principle you could generate just a single image of each class so there's a thousand different images and you generate just those thousand images and nothing else, one of each class. These, these will be sharp, they will belong clearly to a class, and so you have a great inception score. But you don't have any within class diversity, which you also want. So the Frechet inception distance adds that to the evaluation, which says you're also going to look at essentially the mean and covariance of the features in a certain layer, so the inception network, You'll process, instead of just looking at the classification, at some interesting layer, you'll say, let's look at the features, the, fe the activations in that layer, and compute the first and second order statistics in that layer, and compare that between real data and the generated data. And if the first and second order statistics match closely, then likely we are doing better. And Eyeballing-wise, comparing that with this score, indeed, this score seems to reflect that you do better when you have a better score here. This is a distance metric, actually, so you want to be, be lower to do better. Um, to showcase this, um, this is a 2017 paper. Um, this is the Frechet in inception distance, so this is the one we just talked about that also looks at the statistics uh, inside the inception classifier network. You can see as we put more perturbation, going left to right, put more perturbation on images, the FID goes up, which means it gets worse. So indeed, worse images or a pool of worse images will get a worse score than a pool of better images, which is what we'd be hoping for. In contrast, the original inception distance kind of stays flat or bumps up and back down, so it doesn't really capture this um, the way we would want to. So think of the FID as essentially a higher dimensional way of capturing what quality of data you're generating, what diversity of data you're generating, and hence being more precise, also a bit more expensive to evaluate. Okay, so what are the key pieces of GAN? Fast sampling, right? That network could be anything. There's no constraints. It doesn't have to be a flow. No, no particular property. It's just a network that goes from noise to hopefully realistic images with the right setting of the parameters. Optimize directly for what you care about. Perceptual quality of the samples. Right? That's the direct optimization objective. Does it look perceptually similar to my training data? Uh, we have no inference. That is, we cannot evaluate these probabilities. Yes, I talked about this kind of, you know, Parson window, Gaussian blobs approach to still do that in low dimensions, but once you go to high dimensions, which is what, what we usually care about, there is there is no such thing available. Was there a question there? Is there an actual reason why we use the inception, or is it just like a heavy Is there a reason why we use the inception network? It was the kind of state of the art network at that time, so it was the natural one to use at that time, and. People kept using it because the comparisons stay consistent that way. Um, there are better classifiers now. You could argue maybe we should use a new classifier, but how are you going to compare your numbers with the numbers from before? You'd have to effectively rerun all the old stuff to then see where you land. Um, so um, I guess it was a good enough network that people haven't had the motivation to say we need to use a more you know, up-to-date network for this particular purpose. Yes? Yeah, how do we ensure the generator produces images for all thousand classes? Um, the evaluation metrics check for that, but of course we don't directly optimize against them. Um, we'll talk about that a bit later in class. That is actually one of the big challenges with GANs, and there's a bunch of tricks that try to make sure that that happens. None of them we have talked about so far. But it's the, it's the exact thing that essentially motivated 
people to look at um, diffusion models as an alternative to GANs and then kind of took off from there. Yes? So if we put like the, this cache score or whatever that endpoint in the part of the authorization of that GAN, would it help to extend the type of issue? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. If you put the evaluation scores into the objective of GAN, would it improve? It would definitely improve on that objective. I don't know if it would improve the generation quality. That's not super obvious whether it would. Um, I will say there are some things related to it that if people have put into the training mechanisms and we'll look at them later, um, but never exactly that, maybe because they want to have a chance to still have a clean evaluation, but definitely related things have been included. Yes. What makes sure that in a latent space things are close together to the semantic assumption? Is that even a thing in GANs? Yeah. How, how do we ensure that in the latent space is meaningful, that nearby things uh, have similar renderings effectively? Um, as phrased so far, it's essentially just the fact that the generator network is a neural network, and hence, you know, the way it processes things nearby things are more likely going to end up nearby than far away things, but there's not a whole lot of pressure on that in the current formulation. There will be more pressure on that in some later formulations. Great, great questions. Yeah, last one. So, like in the previous So can you still interpolate? Um, so two parts to this. One is if you're generating samples, you could still interpolate between disease and then generate things in between, and it'll actually be pretty meaningful. Now, if you had real images, you don't have disease because there is no encoder network, at least not as formulated so far. It'll come later. There are versions that have an encoder network, but as formulated so far, there's no encoder network, so there's no way to interpolate between the real images just yet. Okay. Great. So let's look at a little bit of theory that might help motivate what we just covered uh, from a few additional angles. So the discriminator is supposed to decide between the two classification labels, real versus generated. Um, now, Imagine just a 1D situation where we have a model slash generator distribution that's shown in green, and then a data distribution shown with the dots. And they're pretty close, um, because maybe the data we're generating is trying to get pretty close to our, um, our training distribution. Now, what would a discriminator look like, an optimal discriminator? Once there is overlap in the distributions, it's not going to be zero in some places, one in other places. It's going to have a gradual transition. The Bayes optimal thing to say when you look at that log probability objective, if you're trying to maximize the log probability score of your discriminator, if the discriminator is uncertain, it's actually encouraged to output exactly its the, pro the correct probabilities. So, for example, over... Over here, it's pretty much guaranteed to be one class, so it's going to be close to one. But then once both classes have probability, it's kind of gradually shifting from one to zero, and that's the optimal thing for the discriminator to do. That's just the way the objective is set up. It's incentivized to output the precise log probabilities of each class. Because, for example, if you landed over here and we go up, then... Looks like the green is about twice as high as the blue, so then you'd want to output something like one-third for one class and two-thirds for the other class. That's the right thing to output. Okay, so we can actually revisit our game theoretic formulation for GAN and um, try to solve it. Since we know what the optimal discriminator should output, we can actually in closed form, effectively, try to solve for this. Um, this, of course, assumes that the discriminator is not bound to be a neural net, because then we have to do it through the weights, which is harder. But just as a thought exercise, 
if the discriminator was not bound to use weights in a neural net to make these decisions, but it's just open-ended, can do whatever it wants, full open-ended possibility, what would it do at the optimum? Um, discriminator acts on GZ and on X. We're going to write the GZ, the generated um, samples, as just X. Uh, we integrate over the entire space of X, and then there's a weighting by the probability of that one being generated. No, we don't have this BGX available, but we're just doing a theoretical exercise here. And so now we get an objective of the type shown here. There's a probability of, under the data of this particular X times log discriminator X, and then probability under the generator of that X times log one minus DX. If you, this is essentially equation of this type, A log Y plus B times log one minus Y. You optimize this for Y, set the grade or the derivative equal to zero, you get Y star equals this. And so we can do the same thing over here with the original notation, and we find that the optimal discriminator is this. So if we knew P data, and we knew P generation, PG, we could write out the discriminator this way. That is where it's trying to go. We'll continue with our thought exercise, and we fill it in. So this is our objective. Why don't we fill it in into our objective, the optimal form. That's why the star is here. That denotes the optimal discriminator. We don't have that available. We can think about what would happen if we happen to get to it. Um, we fill it in, and we can look at this here. And what it's really saying is that the objective the generator is optimizing for, assuming the discriminator always jumps immediately, let's say you're generated discriminator game, and let's say the discriminator always immediately jumps to the optimal thing relative to your data and your current generator status, then what is the generator doing? The generator is optimizing this objective here, which is a KL, two KLs, one from the data to the average of data and generated, the other one from generated to the average of data and generated. Now, remember, in our likelihood-based models that we covered so far, it would have been KL, P, data, P, G, in the notation we're using here. That's not in there. It's different. Um, but it has some similarities, and this could give you some comfort that maybe the equilibrium we're striving for is a pretty good equilibrium because we are getting something where the KL, um, ideally these distributions coincide at the equilibrium, and that's indeed what this would do. If we fully optimize it, we'd get the generator to make sure that, that both of those KLs are zero. Okay, so that's nice. Now let's look at what these KLs really mean. So we have we can have KL data to G, we could have a flipped version. Sorry about that. We could have a flipped version from G to data. And then we could have this one on top here that is this mixed version. It goes in both directions, but it's not just average of both directions because on the other side of the bar there's an average also. So it's like averaging in two places, taking KL in both directions and uh, averaging the thing that's behind the double bar. Let's take a look at what that means in terms of a simple example. If you're doing the regular KL that we have tended to do with our generative models so far, maximizing the log prop that corresponds to this KL over here, let's say the underlying distribution is the blue curve, which has two bumps, and you're trying to fit it with the green curve, which is one Gaussian bump, what will happen is that um, you will try to get put some probability everywhere. And why is that? Because if anywhere there is a data point from P that has zero probability under Q, you hit negative infinity in this objective. So Q has to have non-zero probability everywhere where P has anything non-zero, otherwise you're in trouble. If you flip it, um, what happens then, since Q is what we're choosing, and P is fixed, P is the data, you effectively get the opposite effect. You try to position your Q wherever the probability under P is the highest. And if you let it degenerate, it'll actually just 
become one super tall, narrow peak, right where your P is the highest. That's what would happen. So this is called mode seeking behavior, and this is mode covering. Now, what we have here is in some sense an average of the two things in action and gives you something in between. Now, the reason, I said earlier, you might soon get some intuition as to why GAN-generated examples were more crisp, definitely compared to the models at that time. Well, the models at that time were of this type. And what you see here is that your Q, when you have a, you know, the regular KL, your mode covering, your Q is trying to be everywhere. It needs to avoid zeros. And so what happens is that anywhere between two samples, you're putting probability. And unless you have an amazing, amazing neural network that understands fully how things should be embedded and so forth, you're going to put a lot of probability on things that are not sharp. Because most things in between samples are essentially like blurry average versions of these samples. And so if you do something mode covering, unless you have a really expressive network that's trained extremely, extremely well, you're going to end up with blurry samples effectively. Here, when you're mode seeking, you do the opposite. You try to be very sharp, but the problem is that you just try to replicate one training example and you're done. So we don't want that. We want something in between. And that's in some sense what GANs are giving us. And so that's why they tend to produce um, sharper samples than the models we've seen so far, at least definitely in the um, smaller neural network regime. So trade-offs for compression, you want to make sure everything is covered. So you need the regular KL that's mode covering. For good samples, that would lead to blurring. We just talked about that. So um, you also don't want to pick one mode. That's too extreme. So we need something um, something in between, which effectively GANs are providing. Now, question earlier, how do you ensure that it then still doesn't collapse? Because this game theoretic equilibrium, if the discriminator says, um, let's say, this looks like a real one and that looks like a fake, why doesn't the generator go generate everything where the discriminator thinks it's real and just focuses over there? And that's actually what happens if you train naively. If this is your target distribution, you train naively, with no precautions, you'll essentially hop around between these different modes. You'll be generating a certain mode, and then at some point the discriminator realizes, yeah, I know real data is here too, but it's only 10% of the real data, so I'm gonna put only a 10% probability on it being real and 90% on it being fake. And then your generator's like, oh my God, it's, it's found me out. I gotta hop to a different mode where, it's, where it thinks it's real right now. And then the generator is ahead for a little bit, discriminator catches up, and it keeps going back and forth. So that's one of the big challenges in training these, at least in their original formulations. That's one of the challenges. There's another challenge. Um, we talked about this discriminator, this base optimal discriminator that says, you know, this is exactly what at convergence, if generator is fixed, what will I become if I keep optimizing myself? Should we do that? Should we, let's say, do one generator step and then many, many discriminator steps, and then again, one generator step. Is that a good idea or not? In the pseudocode, definitely that wasn't done. It was discriminator steps followed by generator steps and hop back and forth between the two. So I might give you a hint that probably we don't want to do this. Um, why not? Um, once you train a discriminator extensively, too much in some sense for this to work, um, what happens is it's going to have a zero one output everywhere. Once there's a zero one output everywhere, as you use it, the discriminator as the signal to tell you how to improve your generator, it's just saying no matter what you do in this region, it's all fake. And so this generator gets no signal anymore about in which direction to push its weights to get a more realistic looking image. All the signal has gone. Um, so um, this is pictorially showing essentially if you have sigmoids, the sigmoids will saturate, and so then the derivative of the sigmoid, which is what you care about, will be zero, which is uh, problematic. And same will be true for the um, reverse, uh, the, the other side of the classification. So one thing you can do is do a careful alternating optimization. Make sure a discriminator does not become 
too confident. And so you can have a lot of hyperparameters there to worry about step sizes, number of steps and so forth, batch sizes to make this work. Um, so you can imagine it's not an easy thing to do, but you know, it's part of what you do. You have to alternate. Another thing people do, and it might feel like a hack, um, is essentially just change the objective. Um, you don't like that the sigmoid saturates, just get rid of that saturation where you don't like it. So the original GAN objective for the genera generator has this log one minus D, um, which is problematic when the discriminator becomes uh, close to effectively, in this case, it would be zero all the time saying it's always fake. You replace that with just log D um, instead. So this part has become this here. It's a flipped sign here, but also the, the, the max and the min are flipped. Turns out once you do that, um, you get nice non-zero derivatives, even when the discriminator is very confident that you are a, uh, a fake. And so that's, that's st fairly standardly used instead of the original objective. Now you might say, well, that's interesting. You had this beautiful game theoretic formulation, min max, and now it's a, it used to be a non, it used to be a zero sum game, and now it's this non zero sum game where they're not directly working against each other, but intuitively they're working against each other still because the generator is still trying to fool the discriminator. So conceptually, it's still doing the same thing, but it's not a pure um, zero sum game anymore. But that's, that's how it has been done. Um, then now what I want to do is step through a bunch of the kind of novelties that were introduced after the original paper that as you add this progression all up, essentially ends up with um, the extremely good generation that we started achieving around 2018 that made most people think this is, this is all done. It's going to be all GANs from here onwards. Now we know that didn't end up being true, but the generations are very high quality. It's not that the quality isn't there. Um, it's just training is still a little bit harder often and um, making sure you actually have good coverage remains harder than it is with diffusion models, but who knows? They might make a, a full comeback at some point. So the first time GAN started showing signs of like, this is actually working was a paper by Alec Radford and collaborators. Alec Radford, by the way, also the person who originated the GPT models at OpenAI, the first few generations of them. Um, but before he was at OpenAI, he was doing some independent research um, in a small startup he had started. Um, and as part of that, he, uh, he wrote this paper, which then uh, we read at OpenAI at the time, and we said, okay, we need to recruit this person because you know that was essentially how we recruited at the time. We just see whatever cool stuff comes on archive. Be like, okay, this is a cool paper in archive, one of the coolest in a, in a while. Let, let's make sure we recruit Alec to, to OpenAI. Um, so um, what is what did he do? Um, it was starting to put some real thought into how to set up the neural network architecture to make this work. So you have a code going in, then you have deconvolutions going out. Um, so it's an upsampling effectively from a 100 dimensional code into something that's the size of an image, but it's a learned upsampling that makes it look like an image. This is the generator here, right? This is only the generator, and this is optimizing how well it can fool the discriminator. Then there were a lot of tricks that had to be done, which I think the big takeaway here is that sometimes these tricks matter, and I'll step through them, but also that it's not great when you need to do this many tricks to get something working, because then one mistake somewhere can throw it off, of course. Um, no, no max or mean pooling, um, which was common at the time. Um, upsample was using transposed convolutions, which was on, on the slide, which is a specific choice. Downsample for the discriminator with strided convolutions um, and average pooling. Um, Rally for the generator, leaky rally for the discriminator. This thing can make sense, right? Because you know that you want the discriminator signal to come back to your generator, and a leaky rally will have more signal propagation than regular values through the network. Um, 
10 h for the generator because you want things between negative one and plus one normalized pixel values sigmoid for the discriminator so that's still the same um, batch norm to prevent mode collapse so that that helps introduce more variation um, but it's also weird because you'll see that samples coming from the same batch will have a weird correlation between them because the batch norm makes them interact um, not applied at the output of generator and input of discriminator to relieve that a little bit and then a bunch of optimization details this batch size at the time by the way was large so the way to think of this is that it was observed in this paper that a larger batch size can help you today that's small but it's just the trend is larger is better was um, signaled there um, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll skip over this um, key results there was an Elson bedrooms data set also Elson faces data set on which the results start to looking very very good these are images of bedrooms that look like they could be real bedrooms you can recognize a bed a window a door a dresser and so forth in various of these images same for faces both of these results were just like leaps and bounds beyond anything that anybody had done with any generative model at that time um, you can you can interpolate with them as we talked about this is for the generated images where you have access to your z you can interpolate get meaningful interpolations so there's not a whole lot of pressure on it being meaningful but it does turn out meaningful thanks to the architecture of the neural network um, ImageNet samples 32 by 32 that was something people weren't even thinking of at the time that you could maybe create ImageNet samples even down sample to this resolution was kind of thought of as wow this is really surprising this is possible you could do in the embedding space arithmetic we talked about this at some point with flow models in this case you start with a smiling woman then you subtract a neutral woman add a neutral man so you change the gender and what you end up with is a smiling man um, so this was a clear indication that these things were starting to work um, at the time the interpolations and these additions were done in the Euclidean space of the embedding space since then people have switched to keeping everything normalized work on the circular arc um, of the normalized space that gives slightly better results but again this was a big surprising result at the time here's another one um, man with glasses man without glasses woman without glasses you combine that to give the woman glasses and here you are here's a comparison by the way if you do this in pixel space so this is interpolation in pixel space which clearly is not looking very realistic and so what we're seeing here is that the neural networks have learned something about image structure and able to reflect that in their generations um, you could um, yeah this is more, more interpolation in this case um, we've seen some examples they looked at classification on top so what you can do is you can take your discriminator and then add an extra layer to it and make it a classifier for any kind of classification problem you care about it was trained to classify fake versus real but it turns out by paying attention to just that it's pre-trained very well to then also learn to classify into other classes um, so incredible samples for any generative model at the time at this point people knew GANs can be made to work well with the right architecture and training details uh, not only good samples also good interpolations and the representation learning is working which you can see from the uh, interpolations but also from the classifier train on top problem still unstable training you could train and you could have just terrible results nothing worked you have no learning curve that tells you whether you're doing good or bad because it's this game theoretic thing probably you'd see that the discriminator is winning generator is losing and that's it and but there's no natural like learning curve progression um, and very brittle if you change any of the hyperparameters architecture things might stop working so what happened next um, improved training of GANs um, in fact also involves ALEC um, led by Sim, Tim Salomons at the time at OpenAI um, and introduced five new ideas to make this all work better I'll step through all five of them first one is mini batch discrimination this is a very natural idea um, but hadn't been done at the time the idea is that if you have a batch of samples and your discriminator is looking at that batch of samples 
and they all look similar because you're starting to get mode collapse. The generator is starting to generate realistic things, but they look all very similar. The screener should just say, hey, they all look the same. This must be generated because my data distribution is more diverse. And so instead of a discriminator acting on just one sample at a time, it gets to act on a batch of samples to make its decisions. Um, there is already batch norms. So in some sense, the discriminator was already seeing all samples in some kind of weird interleaved way, but this is making it more explicit. Essentially, it's introducing um, uh, an additional feature vector for each sample every step along the way as the network is proce processing it to look at how different is this sample from all the others in the feature space that we're currently in in my discriminator layer. And so that helps in terms of stabilizing the training because now you don't jump from mode to mode because the discriminator understands whether you're mode covering or not. And when you're not mode covering, you just get a signal that you should be better at mode covering. Then um, the generator, and this goes back to the question, what if you directly optimize for this Frechet inception uh, distance, like the statistics in feature space? Um, it's not doing exactly that. It's not looking at the inception network statistics, but it's looking at the, in this case, um, features somewhere in the um, discriminator. And it's saying somewhere in my discriminator, my statistics of my features between real and fake data should be similar. So rather than just having a classification, which is in some sense one dimensional scalar output, you have a higher dimensional comparison happening earlier on in your discriminator. So this gives a, it's an additional loss, giving an additional signal for how to fix your generator. Then, um, as is done with almost all of these Minimax games, you introduce some historical averaging. So even if you have a simple game like this, minimize over X, maximize over Y, X times Y, um, when, when you do this, um, you'll see that if you do it naively, you essentially go around in, in circles. Because um, one choice of X leads to another choice of Y being the right choice, and you keep circling around. So what do people do is they say, I need to choose my Y against my historical choices of X. If it's good against all past choices of X, then it's a better choice of Y. And then X cannot come up with a new solution all of a sudden that gets me somehow. And so the same thing's happening here. The theta that you end up using um, ends up being an average of all the past settings of your parameters, um, making the training a lot more stable. A more extreme version of this would be to keep many discriminators around and optimize your generator in some decaying way against many discriminators. Um, that's, of course, a lot more effort to keep many networks around, a lot more storage required. This is, in some sense, a approximation to keeping all the uh, past um, incarnations around. Then this is what would happen within a batch uh, with regular batch norm, um, which means very correlated samples. Um, instead, they introduced virtual batch norm, which is you, based on prior data, you compute the mean and standard deviation that would appear in each layer for your features. And now the simplest thing, we just use that, but that's not ideal because you're not adjusting for your current batch. So it's actually using a half-half mix of whatever the mean and variance are from your current batch and mean and variance from what you pre-computed. This stabilizes it, yet keeps um, some adaptation to your current batch. Another thing they did is to, I think of this as weakening the discriminator on um, the cross-entropy loss. Um, you set it as a target 0 0.9 instead of 1. So if you just do log, maximize the log prop, you try to get to 1 but instead set up a cross entropy loss that makes you target 0 0.9. And that way you don't reach that saturating part of the sigmoid of your discriminator. You just say that you can't get there. You're supposed to stay in the regime where it still uh, has more curvature to it. By the way, this is only done on the data. Um, it's a little subtle, but the reason it's only done on the data is um, Essentially, the idea being that if your samples are perfect, your discriminator doesn't need to get you single signal anymore. You're done, so it's less important. Um, but you probably do it on your samples too if you, if you wanted to. 
Then another thing that was done um, is that um, your discriminator, if you have supervised data anyway, it's meant to be unsupervised learning, but all of these data sets, at least in the early days, were all supervised data sets that were repurposed for unsupervised learning. So people are like, well, we know this is ImageNet, we know this is CIFAR, we know there are labels associated with it. What happens if we actually force a discriminator to also classify what class something belonged to? And it turns out if you also do that, your discriminator gives more signal to your generator to learn better. Um, now, that kind of goes back to the inception loss, where you are asking for a good classification. And so in some sense, this is getting pretty close to directly optimizing for that. Um, to their credit, this paper actually in introduced the inception score. So it's not like they saw somebody else's score and then um, said, let's optimize it and beat them to it. It was the paper that introduced the inception score as a way to evaluate GANs. Um, but yeah, their objective, in some sense, a little bit also optimizes for it. These are the samples now. Um, and you know, low resolution are pretty good, but at high resolution, it's still not so great. I mean, there are some dog-like features on the right, um, but they're not, you know, <laughs> they don't look like regular dogs, let's put it that way. Um, actually, this I was gonna skip. Then let's, let's keep going, because we got a lot to cover. Um, we're going to transition now to WGAN, which is going to be a slight reformulation of the objective that is um, actually the most commonly used since, since that came out. So we've seen that effectively with GANs, we're doing this um, Jensen-Shannon divergence optimization. Find a distribution that is minimizing that JSD. Um, this other measures you can have of how far probability distributions are away from each other. So one thing about the KL divergence is there's something funny about it, and same for reverse and JSD, is if I had a distribution that looks, let's say, like this, let's just make it, let's see, actually, I, let's make it continuous because a lot of things we're doing are continuous right now. If I had a distribution that oh come on actually let me make it discrete just a little easier to explain let me, let me let's assume this was our distribution okay and then we have another distribution different color say in blue and this blue distribution maybe looks like actually we just draw it over let's say it looks like this something like this so it's pretty close but it's not super close Obviously, it doesn't have enough probability mass. It can have some more probability mass somewhere else. Maybe it has some more probability mass over here to also integrate to one. Okay. So I can compute KL between blue and red. That's we can do that if we want. Now I'm going to consider a green distribution, which looks the same as the blue over here, but then all the remainder mass sits like right here and right here. This green distribution will actually have the same KL divergence from the red one as the blue has. Because KL just looks at, for any given point, how much do your probabilities differ? And where red has overlap with green and blue, the probabilities are the same. But intuitively, the green distribution is closer when the probability mass is not overlapping with red, at least it's close. And so you would prefer, if you had to choose between green and blue, for modeling red, you'd probably choose green, would be the more natural choice. That's what KL doesn't account for at all. KL doesn't care about that. It might be that it naturally cares about it because maybe you use a Gaussian or something and it softly decays and hence there's no other way around it than that the KL is naturally aligned with this. But if your distribution was, let's say, discrete at the end, your KL will have no such power to do that 
Again, it might again be that your neural network introduces some regularization to help you with it, but in itself, the KL doesn't care. Green or blue, equally good models of red. But we all see that green is a closer model in terms of uh, what's going on. There's something called earth mover distance. And the name is essentially perfect for this. Think of the probability mass as just sand effectively that's sitting there. And think about how many little grains of sand effectively do you have to move to get the red distribution to become the green distribution and over what distance. And clearly you have to move less distance with your sand to go from red to green than to turn red into blue. And so earth mover distance measures that. It says, I have two distributions. This case actually R and G, let's say red and green. Um, and I'm going to measure on average how much I have to move a sample that comes from one distribution to the location of a sample that comes from the other distribution. And I'm doing this while sampling from a joint distribution between the two. So I can make sure that if both have probability mass at a specific location, that I always sample at the same time that location from both distributions. So it's like the optimal correlated version of both distributions. Under that optimal correlated version, how much do I have to move my samples around? Now, finding that optimal correlated distribution is a high dimensional search space. It's not clear necessarily how to find it. Turns out, we're lucky, there is a dual, which is easy to optimize for, or easier to optimize for. You can just, um, so this is what we had, intractable estimate, but there's a duality that says you can get the same number out if instead you try to find a function f that tries to maximally differentiate between samples from x, uh, from r versus from g. So you have two distributions and your function f tries to maximally differentiate the samples. Obviously if the distributions are identical, there's no way to differentiate the expected value of these uh, featureized versions of the samples, but if the distributions are different, then you're going to find essentially a feature vector that highlights the difference between the two distributions, and that will be telling you um, the distance between the two distributions. Now there's a constraint on f, which is essentially saying um, you cannot enlarge distances as you process your data. So if let's say it's an image space, you have pixel values, and they lie between negative one and plus one, you cannot all of a sudden go to negative 100 plus 100 to try to get a large feature vector that makes the difference large. Everything needs to stay on scale. Um, but that's pretty interesting because really what this means is if you think about neural net land, measuring how different two distributions are comes down to just sampling from both of them and then training a neural network to output a feature vector that maximally pulls them apart, the samples while the neural network is in some sense lift shits that is norm constrained of what it can do. So it's a simple neural net exercise to effectively solve for this intractable quantity. Okay. Now this thing here also looks a lot like a GAN objective if you look at it. I mean there is two distributions, there is an F which is called F here. If I had called it D it would have been almost like impossible to to not see it, um, but it's kind of the same thing. If I call this thing here the data, I already have a G there. I call this thing D, I call this thing D. We pretty much have our GAN objective just formulated slightly differently, um, or a different way to get to it at least. So the Wasserstein GAN paper introduces this as a way to effectively train GAN models. Um, and of course, you have to make sure that this thing holds true. What do they do? Um, so this is, this is just the algorithm. Um, we sample some, let me go back to red, it's a little more visible, at least to me. Sample some real data. We get some noise, Z. We generate some samples from that, then we, uh, we find a gradient, this GW stands for the gradient for the weights of the neural network FW, which is trying to differentiate samples from the real data versus the generated data. Then we update the weights. So this here is really discriminator training. And then when we're done, 
we do generator training over here. Um, if you structure your FW in a very particular way, to be a certain kind of um, sigmoid structure effectively, then you pretty much go back to what we had. Now, the interesting thing is that's not what people do because the sigmoid tends to level off your gradient, so people actually don't make that F end with a sigmoid. They just keep F more of an open-ended um, uh, output. So, what happens is if you train a regular GAN discriminator shown in red between these two distributions, you get this sharp cutoff, gradient disappears. We, of course, know with the other formulation we can already avoid this, but the W GAN also nicely avoids this, comes right through, the gradient is there, no zero gradients, um, so the signal will propagate. Um, the beauty is that you also get a number, actually. This Wasserstein thing gives you a number. It tells you something about the distance between your generator distribution and your um, data distribution. So you can actually plot that, right? And you can now see a progression during your training that looks like a learning curve, which is much more satisfying in many ways. You know you're making progress. Um, the Jensen-Shannon Jensen divergence estimate seems to just like stay put because we know that it's supposed to converge to this like negative log four, roughly, I guess. Um, and it's, I mean, yeah, it, it doesn't give you any signal about progression, whereas this one here um, does. Then the bedrooms, um, as good as DC GAN bedroom samples, that's pretty cool. So in some sense, a simpler formulation with a learning curve that we get yet equally good generation. But it doesn't stop there. The good news kind of continues. Um, DC GAN architecture, but with, uh, sorry, without the batch norm. So the bottom is DC GAN, the top is W GAN. We know that DC GAN can do this, but once we remove the batch norm from DC GAN, it fails. We remove the batch norm from W GAN, it's doing just fine. Um, then, um, MLP, um, DC GAN, if you use MLP, it doesn't work. W GAN with MLP, it's not as good as ConfNets, but it's still pretty good. So yet one more sensitivity removed, thanks to using W GAN. Um, the analogy is you know, pretty direct, right? If you look at the original equation we had and the one at the bottom, it's the difference is essentially that you don't get that um, there's no logs introduced, um, but, um, and there's also typically no sigmoids introduced. So there's no sigmoids sitting inside. Here, they, these have sigmoids in them, typically. These will not have that. They will just be real number outputs. Um, so, new divergence measure addresses instabilities of the previous approach, much more robust architectural choices. Um, some progress on mode collapse, avoiding mode collapse and stability, and induces the idea of relationship sense to stabilize scan. Oh, I forgot to mention that in the, in the training thing. Um, in the training, the way to do the Lipschitz thing is just this here. They say, if I cannot um, scale things up to make these features larger, I need to clip my gradients. That's a very naive way to keep things Lipschitz. In fact, it's not gonna keep things Lipschitz. Um, but it's just like a quick hack, and it have, or already gives good results. We're going to see much better approaches uh, in the next couple of slides that will have all the benefits we just saw, and then yes, yet some more. So WGAN GP, you directly penalize the gradient, make that more precise. So um, led by Ishan Gulrajani at the time at Montreal. Um, Weisserstein objective. And instead of saying my critic, they call it critic the discriminator for some reason here instead of just discriminator, but it's the same thing. It's the D, D term. They say, well, if we want it to be Lifshitz, what does that mean? It means that the derivative with respect to the input, the norm of that should be um, less than one. So I'm just going to force it to be as close as possible to one. So that's what this term is. I'm literally saying, I'm going to enforce Lifshitzness. 
Am I enforcing it exactly? No, because I'm supposed to enforce it everywhere, not just on the samples. But at least on the samples, I'm enforcing it. This makes sense. The downside is an extra backpropagation you need to do into um, essentially this objective, but it's directly doing what we're supposed to be doing. Interestingly, where it is done is at x hat. x hat is a random interpolation between a data sample and a generated sample. Convex interpolation. So in some sense, it's trying to span the space better than just doing it on top of the samples themselves. And it might help smooth out the optimization a bit. Pseudocode, um, essentially same kind of pseudocode, um, except that you now also have to generate this mixture of a sample and a real and add this to your objective. Um, and then separately here, you optimize the generator. Some um, comments here how they could not use batch norm because of that Lifshitz objective term. It wouldn't be compatible with that. Um, and then they found that batch norm is really not needed anymore anyway. And so from this paper onwards, people just stop using batch norm in GANS because you don't need it anymore. Might as well simplify it away. Um, I'm going to go relatively fast here on the architecture details. The results are even better than the WGAN results. It's a cleaner setup, so it's a clear uh, progression. Very high quality samples. Um, became a very popular GAN model. 10,000 plus citations at this point. It has been used in the ones we'll cover next. Progressive GANs, style GANs, and so forth. Um, possible negative is a slow wall clock time due to the gradient penalty. It takes a bit, essentially twice as long to train your discriminator. Okay, so where do we go from there? NVIDIA came out with, essentially they started a team that was training GANs quite extensively and was doing very well at it. Um, progressive growing of GANs. Instead of training it all in one go, you start with a subset of your neural network, both for discriminator and generator. You just work on the low resolution part and then keep expanding from there, training larger and larger networks that give you larger and larger, uh, higher and higher resolution. Okay, so it's essentially just a progressive buildup of your network. And they had the best face images ever seen at that time. Same for other type of images, just really good quality images coming out. Um, bedrooms also get even better, higher resolution. Um, you know, this, you know, you might even like think you're shopping somewhere for a bed looking at these pictures. Um, faces at high resolution. This is when people started saying, okay, you know, deep fakes in terms of face generation, you don't know if this is a real or a fake person anymore. It's very, very hard to see. Um, so this was a big, big next step. Then there was still this thing, this gradient penalty was a bit annoying. SN GAN addressed this. So it's out of PFN, as a company in Japan, the, the leading AI company in, in Japan. Um, and they said, um, if what I care about is lift sheets, which means some sense the norm as I propagate through my network cannot blow up, has to say, put, um, I can maybe enforce that in every layer. Don't do it for the entire network, just every layer. And maybe I can find a way to constrain the structure of my layers such that they automatically impose that norm constraint. And then I don't have to do the additional term in the objective. They said, well, when we look at the Lifshitz constant of a layer is a supremum of anything I could pass into that layer of the gradient for that input. Um, and then this is, well, this is really a Jacobian matrix and this is the maximum singular value of the Jacobian matrix. So that's what the Lifshitz constant is computed on that particular input. Um, and they said, if that's what it is, that's actually the same thing as effectively looking at um, the um, the maximum effectively of in a, into a layer, I pass in some vector h, multiply with roughly the linearization of that layer a, and divide them by the norm of h, that number, whatever h maximizes that, is going to give me the Lifshitz constant of that layer. Now, are we going to search for all of them? That would be too much work. Um, so what do you do? You just look in your batch of samples that goes through, 
which one, you know, what they achieve in terms of norm, and you make sure it doesn't go above one effectively. You try to keep it above one. Um, and actually, the way you can do that by design, if you want to, is by literally dividing by the norm. So if you go through and then, well, actually, you divide, you need to know, you essentially look at the norm and divide it back out. If you do that, you're, you're done. So the norm of AH, you divide by that at the end of your layer, then nothing goes scaled above one. Um, so pretty, pretty, oops, pretty simple idea. No, I don't want to go back there. Um, so there's a long explanation in the paper how, you know, getting the actual singular value would be too much work. And what they're really doing by doing this is doing one step of a, what normally would be an infinitely long iteration method to get the correct singular value. Um, these are their architecture choices, and they also get really nice generations with effectively a simpler way to set up everything. One thing that you might have heard me mention is that sometimes we, um, well, often there's data sets where the class label is available. There's many ways to, to do that. Um, this particular paper, they use the last approach, but there's really, you could feed it in in the beginning. You want to generate it um, into your discriminator. No, actually. Yeah, into a discriminator, I'm generating a sample of this class. Is this a correct sample for that class or not? You can feed it in later. You can feed it in even <coughs> later. Um, so there's many choices that you can make where you exactly feed that information in. But the idea here is that you could, in principle, make your discriminator decide not just whether something looks realistic, but looks realistic for a specific class that you're supposed to be generating. Um, very high quality class conditional samples. Um, first GAN to work on full ImageNet, million image data set, and many computational benefits over the previous versions. Then the unavoidable happened, of course, in a great way. Um, actually, Ian Goodfellow decided to do something with GANs again, but that's not the unavoidable part. The unavoidable part is that change your architecture to use self-attention. Um, you know, it's 2017, 2018. It was the time to, you know, write some easy papers in some sense where, you know, whatever was done before, you now do it with self-attention transformers and it all works a lot better. It's like a beautiful window of opportunity. And this paper nailed it for, uh, for GANs. Um, replaced, you know, the, not all the conf, but some of the conf layers with self-attention. Um, little tricky thing there that I had to deal with is that Self-attention layers are not lift sheets as is, so they change them up a tiny little bit. Um, some details there. They, I believe they switched to using inner products rather than exponentiated inner products um, to help with that. Um, but other than that, essentially self-attention version of, of what was already existing and the results were a lot better. Here are some of the generations, and now you have an attention operator. You can also see why, uh, what it's paying attention to the discriminator to make certain uh, decisions about real or not, or certain classification. So very nice, uh, diverse uh, generations, even within class, quite diverse. Um, better inception score, look at that, um, and also better FID score. FID, lower is better, inception higher is better. All that leads up to Big GAN 2018. Um, beautiful generations of a level nobody had seen before, even higher resolution than had been done before. Um, really amazing uh, results. This was done by DeepMind. Um, great interpolations possible. Um, what did they do? To enforce the spectral norm constraint uh, to get the Lifshitz property, they said, um, if I look at the weights matrix, if I multiply with itself, um, essentially, I want it to be, if it becomes identity matrix, that means my weight matrices are orthogonal, which was just rotating things. Now that's a little restrictive. I don't want to just be rotating things, but if I ensure everything off diagonal is zero, then I'm essentially not scale, and I keep the diagonal at a good scale, not scale up, uh, between zero and one, effectively between negative one and plus one, then I am getting something where I'm enforcing the Lifshitz constraint while just having a very simple 
additional term. By the way, this here, this here is a matrix. This here, one minus i, is another matrix. This is all ones, and then um, i is only on the diagonal one. So this becomes effectively zeros and one everywhere else. And so what this is doing, it's saying that I'm masking out the diagonal. I don't care about the diagonal, what value it takes on, but everything off diagonal, I want to bring as close as possible to zero because I'm minimizing this norm. So that's, that's uh, essentially the way it then became done. Some details into how it was set up. Um, they use um, state-of-the-art architectures for that time. You can look at it in detail later, essentially ResNet blocks. Um, pretty large network, much larger than anybody had done at the time, both for generator and discriminator. Um, larger bats, batch size. Um, batch norm, they, they did some batch norm again um, across the multiple GPU cores, not just within your core. Increasing model size wider is as helpful as going deeper with your network. Fuse the class information at all levels, not just at the beginning or just at the end. Um, hinge loss um, rather than sigmoid loss and um, the, the trick on, from the previous slide. And then that's the regularization. And this one is essentially saying when you sample from your Gaussian, you get your Z variable you're going to generate from. Sometimes you can get a, you know, Gaussians have a long tail. You can go pretty far out. They said even though your Gaussian could go, you know, anywhere truncate, truncate into this region. Don't sample out of negative one plus one. So you don't get this like out of distribution things coming into your network. I mean, these are essentially some relations that you can look at. We have a lot to cover still. I mean, so I'm gonna go a little fast on this one. Um, but essentially, I would argue that the generations from, from Big Gan are quite comparable to a lot of generations still that are state of the art today. Um, very good generation quality. Um, from there, it got morphed into style GAN. Uh, the idea there was instead of feeding it a Z once and generating from it, you feed your Z. Oops, why did I do that? You feed your Z into a large neural network that generates an embedding vector W that's more meaningful. You think, think of this almost like training a prior. In our models that we covered in previous lectures, in a VAE, in a flow model, maybe you want to train a prior, PZ. I, I would say that you can think of this as doing the same thing. It's essentially morphing your Z from a Gaussian space into a space where it's more meaningful. And then you feed it in every layer of your generator um, to generate your image. In addition, you feed in some noise. And the hope here is that the Z that turns into W captures the structural aspects of your image. Is it a man? Is it a woman? Do they have a beard? No beard? Do they have hair? No hair? Things like that. And then the noise might be more subtle things that are more individual variation between individuals rather than high level characteristics um, that would go through the Z variable. The Z variable, by the way, interacts in a very limited way with uh, everything in the network. If you look at this previous slide, it's just going in here. So you have this layer of activations. What's happening to it? This, there is a rescaling and an offset that's being done. So you are already normalizing by subtracting the mean, dividing by the standard deviation. And now essentially you're saying the style of this particular image is that I don't want to be fully normalized. I want to put myself maybe at a slightly different scale, a slightly different center location for what I'm generating. You can do style transfer because the style variables you can control individually. And so you can go, um, let's say, here is sources. Here are other sources. You try to bring style from B into A. Um, so here it's coarser. Here it's middle and here it's fine. So for coarse, um, you know, this person becomes this person here with a coarse mixing of the two. If you do a much finer mixing, 
go all the way down here, this person roughly stays the same, but just some small details are changed to look more like a person at the top. Um, so th this was the first time people had real control over the images they're generating. Um, this can be done at high resolution. Um, they also investigated, do you need that noise variable on the side that introduces that slight individual variation in some sense to each image? Can't you just have the style variables? The answer is yes, because otherwise it becomes a little too templated if you don't have that noise variable. It doesn't look as realistic. It looks a little smoothed out um, if you don't have it. People don't realize that there are these, these are people at NVIDIA that like are, you know, there's graphics people there. They want everything to be perfect. And so they see like, oh my God, do you see this thing over here? And like on this car here, and you see this, this blurry thing over here, like this looks great, but there's still like this little thing that um, I'm not happy with. And if you go at the activations in previous layer, you'll see indeed, there's like a funny thing there where clearly some things were saturated, like something saturated to the top or to the bottom. And it's leading to these artifacts in the generation at the end. And so at the time, actually, if you needed to train a neural net model to decide whether something was AI generated or not, you just need a neural net that can find those little, little blur, blurry things that you'd know immediately. And if you had a you know magnifying glass, you could look at it yourself. Um, they made a very small modification. <laughs> um, essentially, remember that the Z variables could scale and offset the mean of the hidden activations, um, they were only allowed to do one of those two in this. And I, now I'm forgetting which one of the two, but either only scale or only shift, not both. I forget which one they removed. They removed the one that ensured that this artifact um, doesn't show up anymore. And then you have this beautiful uh, pictures without the, any kind of these little uh, water bubbles anywhere. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, from here, I'm gonna go relatively fast over a few things. Then I'm gonna cover one thing still in quite a bit of detail, and then I'm gonna take a break, and then Philip will, will do the last part of the lecture, uh, looking at some very recent architectures. Okay. Your discriminator is too powerful. You don't like it. You don't want it to erase all the signal. What do you do? You feed into your discriminator something that comes from an encoder rather than directly having access to the original image. And now if that encoder has some kind of Z embedding effectively that is generating on which you put an information bottleneck, which means you put noise on the Z. So you generate a Z, you put noise on it, and then the discriminator works on that Z. Your discriminator will have a hard time saturating and being too powerful. Because typically in GAN training, the challenge you run into is the discriminator wins. And then everything stops, your generator is lost. And so this is a way to weaken the discriminator. Um, pictorially, you know, discriminator would just do this. If you're not careful, historically, people would put noise on their samples, hoping that it spreads them out more. And that way, making it a little harder for the discriminator. But it's kind of hacky and noise in pixel space is not so great. So really what we're doing now is we're going to put um, discriminator is going to get an embedding and they're going to effectively have noise in the embedding space Z and that'll um, even when there's overlap in sample space in some sense because the discriminator only gets Z and there's noise on Z, um, it will get this kind of bend curve and keep propagating the signal. Okay. Creative GANs are essentially the same thing, but now you condition also on an image when you generate. Um, so pix to pix is kind of the, the common term, actually largely pioneered at Berkeley and Alyosha Efros's group. Oh, by the way, talk about Alyosha Efros. Anybody see the OpenAI release today, Sora, the video generation? Yeah, a lot of people, I imagine. Um, the, the two people leading the project also are Alyosha's students. They're working on essentially the same thing as far as I can tell, diffusion transformers while they were here. Now they've been for a year at OpenAI, and look how much the results have gotten better. Um, it's pretty amazing. So imagine you're working on something here, and now you spend a year at OpenAI, how good your results will be after that year. Um, if you convince the right people at OpenAI to you know, give you the right budget to, uh, to make it happen. But you know, pr pretty amazing what one year can, can do, and, and a change of compute resources. Um, so 
but also this, this is also coming out of Alyosha's group. Um, the idea being that instead of generating out of nothing or on a condition on a class label or something, you feed in an image and you want to generate the same image but in a different style. For example, colorized. Well, um, you could then put a discriminator there to say whether it's real or fake and then train a generator network that is a pix to pix generation. What's the problem? Well, there's a lot of realistic looking images that don't match the original, and so you need a discriminator to not just say fake or real, but does it match the original also? So what do we need to do? We need to change this, and the discriminator takes in both the original, so loss function for discriminator, takes in both the original and the generated, and needs to evaluate whether they are a realistic pair. So now your real data also will need to generate a counterpart that is, in this case, grayscale, and you need to feed in both there too, and the discriminator learns to understand is this a valid pair or not. Um, that's, that's the key idea here. Um, one thing that might be worth highlighting is that um, in addition to doing that, they also still use an L1 reconstruction loss on the images. Because when you're training, you know the reel that you're supposed to generate because there's a clear reel for that thing you condition on. And L1, the idea with L1 is that L2 loss, which is a squared loss, makes you fuzzy, makes you try to go in between everything. L1 loss encourages you to choose a specific value rather than try to be in between. And in fact, you could take this a step further. I don't know if they did it or not, but you could just take a softmax output and you could probably get even sharper results with that because that can model multimodal outputs even better than L1 would be able to handle. They weaken their discriminator quite a bit to make this work. These are patch discriminators rather than a single discriminator for the whole image, but also gives more signal for every region. You know whether it was looking realistic or not. This is a single discriminator. And then if you use a multi-patch discriminator, you get this kind of, um, this case goes from segmentation to original. Um, people do this for drawings to generate cats. You just have to draw the outline. Things you can go check out. This was a funny one at the time. Um, you draw anything and it turns it into a cat. Um, so pretty cool. Um, black and white to color. Um, then NVIDIA did something similar for um, changing the style of people's faces, going pix to pix for that. Um, and then Alyosha's group did something where you could have a dance video of one person and then a little calibration video of yourself and then you could make it look like you were dancing the way the original person was dancing. So you take the best dancer in the world. Um, to make it funny though, um, they, <laughs> they also picked a ballet dancer, um, which is a little more extra fun to watch them uh, incarnated as a ballet dancer. But essentially what happens is uh, there's a bit more work they did under the hood. They extracted the pose explicitly. So it's not just picks to picks, it's like picks to pose and then pose and calibration in some sense pictures of the person you want to get her back onto uh, video. People do all kinds of uh, creative work with this, um, more NVIDIA work. Um, and you can even, you know, just, you can have the generator not generate pixels directly, but the learning to paint, essentially the generator has to do brush strokes. So a sequence of brush strokes has to lead to a painting that's indistinguishable from a realistic painting. And so you're learning a policy effectively. It's, it's a, it becomes a, um, a policy learning problem to do the right sequence of brush strokes to get the painting out. Okay, GANs and representations. Um, there are two papers I'm going to cover here. One I think you're going to be doing as part of your, your homework. Um, pixel values are not a good representation. We know that. Um, we'd rather talk about a digit like it's a five, it's tilting to the right, it's a medium thickness of the pen stroke or pen impression and um, have some codes associated with that. So, if we want that, this is regular GAN, 
instead of having just Z, we add a code here, C. You might say, just adding a code, is that really going to do anything? Is that going to isolate out what I want? Well, it could, because in some sort of what you're doing, you're introducing a prior, right? And for example, if this code here is a one-hot 10-dimensional vector, and you're doing digits, the most natural thing for it to become is to encode if it's a 0, 1, 2, 3, 9. So by putting the right kind of prior on here, you can possibly enforce certain things to appear. To help that, you can then add also a additional classifier that you need to be able to recover the code. So the code needs to be something that can be recovered with a classifier. So now you have two priors, really. Whatever distribution you choose here, and whatever architecture you choose in Q determines what is easy to detect or not easy to detect, and hence will correlate to what you end up putting into your code versus what goes into your Z. Now, two networks, why? Um, you can just merge it into one network that is both doing the fake versus real classification and the recovery of the code. You can actually do some math to show that's actually optimizing some mutual information objective between the code and the image that's being generated. Um, you can look at that later. There is C1, um, one of these code variables. You see that the viewpoint on the seat is changing. Very Z, the type of chair is changed. Very another entry of C1 um, changes the size of the chair. And so we now have control over the viewpoint, over the size. Um, for people, we have control over their emotions expressed, over their them wearing glasses or not wearing glasses. Um, now, what happens if you do this where you're you essentially put this thing here. This is what we called Z and this is what we called C. So we have a big Z and then it's ImageNet training, 1024 categories, assuming here, um, and we have that as the C variable. It turns out if you train a large model that way, big GAN will produce conditional generation effectively. It figures out that there's a thousand something classes and generates accordingly. So that's pretty cool. Um, so more examples of that, and also high quality images. Now to get a representation out, the big bigan, what it does is says, I'm also gonna train an encoder. Okay, you might say, well, I'm gonna train an encoder and a decoder. In a VAE, you go encoder, decoder, it's a loss where you need to decode back into what you had, that's not done here. It's with a different loss. What's being done is a discriminator that says, are the encoding and the original proper matches effectively? So you feed into your discriminator a real and a encoded of real, or you feed in a sample and the Z that originated the sample, and it needs to determine whether they are compatible or not. Um, so it's another way to make your latent code related to your image in a meaningful way. Um, here are some unconditional image generations from it, all, all looking very good. Um, more. Um, I thought I removed those slides, but I guess they stayed. Um, so what's done here is you go into the latent space Z and you vary, essentially, in latent space, and you see that indeed you get very similar images, so the latent space is very meaningful. Um, here we look at reconstruction, so what's done is you take an image, you put it in latent space, you encode it, and then you reconstruct. And what you see here is interesting. These are not very precise reconstructions. But that's not necessarily surprising because we did not train for reconstruction. We never asked for a correct <coughs> reconstruction. We just asked for the semantic mean effectively to be the same, and we're getting that. The same type of dog in the reconstruction. The details are not the same because we're not trained to do that, but semantically, clearly these latent variables capture what we want them to capture. So very, very interesting that that's working out. Um, more reconstructions, and so it's very, very interesting how well this works. 
So this is a place where I want to give a bit more detail. Um, how about an energy model? If I say the probability of an image X is E to the power of negative energy associated with X, and then I have to normalize. Huh? Z is the sum over all possible images. Not all the images in my data set, all the possible images. So for even for a small resolution, that's impractical. You cannot enumerate all possible images, but that's, that would be a correct probabilistic model. Um, we saw 28 by 28 by 3 images have 10 to the power 16,000 um, possibilities. So you can't really um, do that summation. In fact, Google's calculator says it's infinity if you compute that number, which is, I thought is pretty funny. Um, so impractical to compute a summation over infinitely many terms, um, but we need that. Right? If you don't do it, if you don't normalize by Z, what are you going to do? You're going to train it for every image, drive the energy as low as possible, and there's no counterforce. The Z is the counterforce. It's making sure that you can't just drive everything down and then somehow win everywhere. No. When you drive everything down, that means everything is becoming likely, which means Z will be a very large number, and you divide by that, and that is the counterforce you, you need. So... Um, this is our objective, looks very similar to things we've done before, but now the energy is being output here. But this log z is annoying to compute because it has a sum over infinitely many terms. So what do we do? Um, this is our log z. Um, it's a sum over all possible x. Well, what if we want a sample? Well, let's introduce a distribution q phi. Multiply and divide by it. And now we have an expectation, rather than a sum over implementing things, we have an expectation against the distribution. To compute that, we can just sample from the distribution to get an approximate uh, estimate. And so that's what we're going to do. We're now going to essentially use this distribution Q phi to sample from. And if we work it out, we of course want to maximize over Q phi to make that bound as tight as possible when we swap the log and the expectation. Um, and this is what we end up with. Okay. What is this saying? We're trying to find a Q phi that maximizes this, which means minimizes the energy, right? Um, assuming we're maximizing this objective, and then um, there is also this entropy term. So we're trying to minimize the energy while maintaining high entropy with our distribution. So that's that's our objective now, we add this into our original, and really what we get is a GAN objective again. The energy, if I had called it D, you would have already known, is a discriminator in a GAN. So what we see here is that the W GAN objective is effectively the same as optimizing an energy-based model where we're willing to do a sample-based approximation against a distribution Q phi that we use for sampling that we optimize at the same time. And Exactly the same. We now know that we maybe should have added an entropy term in our W GAN if we really want that energy counterpart interpretation. So you could say, hey, maybe a W GAN would do even better if we add an, energy, an entropy term. Not always tractable to compute, by the way. It depends on the type of model architecture that you use. But if it's something where you can't compute it, then um, maybe you want to add it. Um, but other than that, it's the same. Um, from W again, we know that we want to have this Lifshitz constraint, so that might be an incentive in the other direction. It might say, hey, when you train an energy-based model, you need to constrain your weights and not be just as expressive as you want, have some constraints there. So that's not popping up here, but um, we could add it. And so if we added that, we'd have some kind of combined model of everything um, that turns out to be an energy-based model. I'm not going to take any questions right now, um, just because we're going to be running short soon. So we effectively W GAN energy-based model, pretty much the same thing for a specific approach to training the energy-based model. If you're training it by computing your log Z by introducing a effectively important sampling distribution that you sample from to compute that as an expectation. Um, so 
Entropy easy to compute? Generally, no, but sometimes it can be done. It might be worth investigating um, if you're interested in this direction. Okay, actually, I want to highlight one thing. So John Schulman has a write-up here that I'm linking in the slides, and that write-up um, does a slightly different formulation, and you end up with the exact original GAN, effectively, um, with regularizer terms. So instead of ending up with this W GAN, you end up with something that has the sigmoids in it um, if you set it up just slightly differently. So this here, I'm going to skip entirely. It'll, it's in the slides if you want to check it. Um, hasn't seen as much activity. It was kind of emerging a couple of years ago as maybe something that would see a lot of activity. It hasn't seen as much activity yet. Um, and I'm going to highlight these two right now, and then we'll take a break, and Philip will do the, um, the Giga GAN and the VQ GAN. So you can use GANs for imitation learning. You want... Oh, here it is. Here's what I wanted to show. So if you have a classifier where you are supposed to output something, but you're supposed to ignore a certain property, let's say you want to classify whether somebody should get a mortgage approved or not by a bank. The bank wants to do it with a neural network. Um, but you say, hey, there are protected properties. You cannot do it based on maybe, I don't know, age, race, other things. You could say, well, don't put them into the input. Remove them from X. But there could be proxies that's still encoded. Maybe your zip code says a lot about your race or your age, or maybe um, where you studied says something about it and so forth. And so instead of just removing it from the input, which probably you have to do anyway, you don't want to be removing everything to make sure there is no proxies for it, because then you've got nothing left. So instead, somewhere in the middle here, you branch out, have another network that um, tries to predict the properties that you don't want to use. So this one tries to predict, let's say, race, tries to predict age, maybe other things that you don't want to be able to predict. And you put a negative sign on that one in your training. So this one tries to predict it, but your network here, this part effectively, is trained to erase the information that's needed to predict that. And so this one works as hard as it can to still extract it, but here it's erased as much as possible while retaining enough to satisfy at the, at the original objective or maximize the original objective still. So that's something you can do with a GAN that, that's pretty cool. The same thing you can do is with, uh, if you, let's say, train something in simulation and real, you can um, do a similar loss in the middle where you have data from sim and real, and you say, I want to be indistinguishable whether this embedding came from sim or real. If my embedding is indistinguishable from sim or real, then everything else that happens after will generalize between sim and real. Because I can mostly train my robot, let's say, in sim, because it's just relying on an embedding space where everything is identical between sim and real. This can be a lot to re require. I mean, it's not always realistic that that is possible, and so you might have to erase too much information, but sometimes it can actually work quite well. Okay, let's see. So, um, all right, take it away, Philip. Okay. Um, so, cool. Peter presented um, a lot of GAN architectures and a lot of progress that GANs have made. Um, but kind of what we've seen in the last few years is that people have this trend of trying to scale things up to models as large as possible um, and generate really high quality um, visual results. Um, and so GANs, we've kind of seen a little bit of falling off in this type of era, but we'll look at some of um, the improvements that GANs have also made within the past few years towards this direction of scaling up. Um, so one of the earlier works, this was around um, 2021, um, was StyleGAN XL. Um, and so one of the things, one of the properties of StyleGAN is that it actually, while it, it's able to uh, produce really high quality um, images for, for example, like faces, it actually struggles a lot um, for very diverse data sets like ImageNet. And so BigGAN architecture was actually uh, state of the art for just ImageNet. Um, what they're showing here is that um, StyleGAN v3, which was a, a slight improvement on StyleGAN v2, um, is not able to scale very well to ImageNet, whereas this improved StyleGAN XL, um, they're able to make a lot of variety of improvements to get these really high quality image net generations. And they're actually able to scale this to 1024 by 1024 pixel scale. 
Um, and so um, they, uh, they have a variety of improvements that they apply for StyleGen XL, but we're actually not going to uh, cover them very much because um, I'll have the slides here so that you can look at them if you're interested in this direction after. But I think, um, yeah, it's, it, it's an important one to know, but maybe not the direction that this paper that came just last year, GigaGAN, um, used. So GigaGAN is a text-to-image GAN model that is the first GAN to scale to 1 billion parameters successfully, and they generate very high quality images conditioned on text, similar to a lot of the diffusion models that we're seeing today. And as a result of being a GAN model, they inherit a lot of the nice properties that we see from GANs, um, including very fast generation. Um, and we see also the nice disentangled prompt mixing and interpolation properties that Peter was showing earlier with the style GAN. Uh, in addition, they also show really high quality upscaling results. Essentially, you take a low resolution image, and then from there, you can generate a much higher quality, to res uh, a much higher resolution image. So, just really quickly, um, here are some of the GigaGAN results. Um, these are text conditioned image generations with the text at the bottom. And while we've probably seen a lot of these types of generations in the AI models already, this is a very impressive result for a GAN uh, architecture. Uh, and this is their upsampling um, results, so it's kind of hard to see on the screen, I guess, but if you look over here, here's a zoomed-in picture of what the input is, um, and then over here they have the various different um, upscaling methods. This one is um, a diffusion-based stable diffusion upscaler, whereas these are the GIGAN results, and they're able to scale up um, images up to 4K resolution. And you can see that it has all these really nice high-quality details. Um, so how do they do this? Um, they have a couple of additions and tricks that they use in order to get the model to train stably to, to the scale, and we'll go over those now. So the first, um, the first trick that they do is they uh, introduce this layer called adaptive sample kernel selection. So the goal with introducing this layer is to increase the model capacity size. Um, and the approach that they take here is to try to, rather than just scaling up the convolutional layer itself by increasing the channels, they actually have the model learn um, the filter to use. And the way that they do that is they instantiate a bank of n convolutional kernels. So um, yeah, normally you would just have one kernel of C in, C out by, by your kernel size, um, but instead they instantiate n of them. Um, and then in order to actually choose one, they apply a softmax. So in StyleGAN, we had our style vector w, and here they're taking that style vector w and then learning um, weights um, over the dimension n to, um, yeah, to select which, um, which of the kernels in the bank that it should use. So this can be seen as kind of like a differentiable way to have the model choose which of these kernels to use. Um, and then they use the same um, modulation kernel that um, StyleGAN uses on top of that. Um, so the next trick that they use is the addition of attention layers. So Peter presented uh, self-attention GAN earlier, um, and they found that if you just take the StyleGAN2 architecture and then directly apply the um, self-attention layers, it actually results in the training collapse of the StyleGAN. And um, one of their hypotheses is because that the self, um, that the dot product self-attention is actually not Lipschitz. And so they were concerned that maybe this was resulting in some conditioning uh, or numerical problems within the model. Um, and this paper over here, the Lipschitz constant of self-attention, they studied this issue. Um, and this paper introduces or proposes a slightly different distance metric that enables you to make the self-attention um, actually Lipschitz. And um, what we can see over here, we have at the bottom left the typical dot product attention. And you can just consider this as a metric um, that's taking the distance, some distance metric um, between these two features. Um, and instead, you can replace this distance metric with anything else. So what they, if you use this, it turns out if you use this L2 distance instead of the dot product distance, 
um, as well as tying the weights of the query and the keys, then this will make the self attention of the trace. Um, of course, now that we're doing text conditioning, we also have to condition the model on the actual text that we care about. And so the way that they're doing that is they're taking a pre-trained clip encoder here and then taking a few additional layers to process those clip features. Um, with text, there's going to be a token per um, text token as well as they have this global token, which is the uh, token that is typically used in clip that has some global context over the entire sentence. And they separate out these local tokens and the global token. So they incorporate the global token information into the style vector w. In the original style GAN, you just take some noise vector z and then pass it through a set of layers. Here we're taking uh, the concatenation of z as well as the global text token to um, extract out our style vector w. Um, and the way that now our w um, style and our local uh, token information is actually incorporated into the network is used through cross attention. So the local information is passed into the network through these cross attention layers. Um, and the global information is incorporated through the style vector w, which is then passed in through the um, adaptive kernel layers as well as the self attention layers. And the way that they incorporate the style vector into the self attention layers is they just append it as an extra token in the self attention. So um, another component that they needed to do to make this work is multi-scale generation. And so one of the ideas with the progressive growing of Dan's paper was that um, maybe it's helpful to grow the image uh, in a progressive manner. They kind of take uh, uh, maybe inspiration or a similar type of idea, but instead of progressively growing, they just have the model directly output uh, or directly predict images at different resolutions. So um, yeah, you can see, for example, out here, they extract out the feature and then directly try to predict the image at maybe this resolution. This one is being directly predicted at this slightly higher resolution. And so then they have these um, images at different levels. Um, and these are the resolutions that they're predicting at. So in terms of the generator architecture, this is a quick summary. They, um, yeah, and, and they note that it's important to keep some other details of StyleGAN. Um, and the StyleGAN Excel paper, which I had mentioned, um, they found that turn, you can turn off some of the additional <coughs> features of StyleGAN V2 to help improve performance, or, or those, those are not necessary for performance, and so they remove those. Okay, so now we'll quickly go over the discriminator. The discriminator um, now has to take, uh, as we just discussed, the generator is producing images at multiple scales. And um, so we want the discriminator to be able to um, leverage these images as well. They define this, their, their generator feature extractor as phi, um, which takes in this full image input and then tries to um, predict uh, real or fake at the output over here. Um, but they also define these subset um, feature extractors, phi i to j, which takes in your image at a level i and then outputs a feature map at level j. So for example, um, if we look at the feature map like um, uh, one, three, then that would take in this image at this level, pass it through these layers of the network, and then extract out some features over here. And so this i greater than one indicates like a late entry into the network, and you can also have an early exit from the network. Um, they also then define a discriminator for each. This also essentially lets you define multiple discriminators. So they can define a discriminator, dij, which takes in the image at level i and then outputs um, a real or fake from the features at level j. Um, so again, if we're looking at like discriminator 1, 3, that would take in this image and then pass through the network over here and then try to predict fake over here. Um, and this lets them construct what they call a multi-scale input output loss, where 
the, they actually compute all possible combinations of input and output scales, um, resulting in like this many losses using the traditional GAN loss, as well as what they call a matching loss. Um, and uh, this matching aware loss looks like this. Essentially, one issue that they found with training this model is that, especially early on in the network, the discriminator tends to ignore the caption or the text conditioning that um, we're trying to have the, ge the generator follow. And so it's not very good at generating images that are following the caption. So what they want to do is encourage the discriminator to take the text caption and classify real or fake based on that as well. So normally you would just have um, sample a caption, a pair like X and the image X and the caption C. Um, but then they, now they also additionally sample a random caption from your data set C hat. And then you essentially want the discriminator to classify um, the incorrect caption with the random image as um, a fake image, as well as a fake generated image with the incorrect caption also as fake. Um, so that so now we have the um, multi-scale loss, and then they also have two additional losses that they um, add to get this to work. So one is the clip contrastive loss. Um, we haven't talked about clip, but I think we will in future lectures. But essentially, they take a pre-trained clip model, which encodes text and image, and then train the model, uh, and then the losses how well those generated images and text match uh, match each other. And they also use this vision-aided GAN loss. And this vision-aided GAN loss was introduced in this paper, Ensembling Off-the-Shelf Models for GAN Training. And um, one of the features here is that you want, um, they found that if you leverage off-the-shelf pre-trained models, you can actually help uh, make the discriminator more powerful. And so specifically, they're using a clip image encoder. They extract, uh, which is over here, they pass in uh, the generated image, and then they append some intermediary layers that are learned. Uh, they, they chop off some layers and then add some new layers, and then they just freeze the pre-trained encoder, and then they train those newly added layers um, to define an additional discriminator. Um, and so these are all the tricks that they needed to do in order to scale up to um, their final GigaGAN model. Um, the, you can see kind of ones that um, applied some of the most help, one of which was the attention over here. Um, the addition of these matching aware losses brought down the FID this much. And then um, the uh, addition of the clip loss was also very helpful. In comparison, um, in, in the modern day, we have very powerful diffusion models. So this was kind of a comparison um, between how GigaGAN is versus a lot of these other diffusion-based models. So um, over here, we have the FID. And then we can also look at inference time in terms of how fast it is to sample, as well as, um, yeah. And um, it's slightly unfair comparison because all of these models are operating at 250. Uh, 256 pixels, um, but you can see that GigaGAN has an FID that is comparable to a lot of these other diffusion-based ones better than some of the earlier ones, um, and slightly worse than some of the more recent models, but these are also slightly bigger. And also in terms of just inference speed, GigaGAN is the fastest, where even compared to a lot of these like distilled diffusion models, which are trying to essentially improve the uh, sampling speed for these slower diffusion models. The final model is able to achieve these types of really nice capabilities, which enable you to, um, uh, yeah, so, so yeah, um, sorry. The, the final model allows you to have these like mixing latent capabilities that we saw with StyleGAN. And so what they're doing over here is they're starting with a generation, for example, a cube on a tabletop. And then so they have this thing with, uh, this is just the raw generation given the text caption. And then they're trying to 
now maintain the low level details, but then change the high level features with a text prompt. And so now you can generate a new text prompt, um, for example, an X with the texture of Y on the table. Um, y in this case will be croquet. And then you apply the style vector to just the second half of the network. And that lets you essentially text condition the low level, just the low level features. Um, and we see that here with the cube or the ball or the teddy bear having these types of um, having these types of textures. Um, in this experiment that they're showing over here, they have they're doing the prompt interpolation, um, and again, uh, now it's a lot more controllable because we can text condition the model. So, for example, um, we can change the caption over here: um, "A modern mansion in." A sunny day is this blatant. A modern mansion in a sunset is this one. Um, and a Victorian mansion is here. So if you remember, um, with StyleGAN, we sample a noise Z and then pass it through the network. And then with, the, with GigaGAN, they're taking the caption C and appending that here. And so what they do here is they fix the noise vector Z and then they just change the caption. That lets you kind of maintain the same random noise, but then change um, how the text description changes it. Um, GigaGAN is still maybe a little bit off from the state-of-the-art text-to-image models that we see today from Diffusion. Here are some of the failure modes with this specific text prompt. It's not as good as, say, Stable Diffusion or Dolly 2 at these spatial relationships um, with the skateboard. Um, and doesn't, yeah, really understand the concept of the skateboard as much as these other yeah. approaches. Really quickly, we mentioned the upsampler. Um, and the upsampler architecture is basically the exact same as the generator, except we are, uh, we, there's only like a very few modifications. So the first is now we're conditioning on an input image that is already at some resolution. So before, we had just a constant that was fed into the bottom of the network. But instead, we're replacing that with a UNet architecture with three downsampling blocks and six upsampling blocks that takes in the low resolution image. They, and they make some small modifications on the uh, output loss. One is the removal of the vision aided GAN loss. And instead, they add this LPIPS perceptual loss. Uh, this LPIPS perceptual loss is very similar to the L2 loss, except instead we're going to take two pre-trained networks or we're going to take one pre-trained network, um, the VGG network in this case, and we're going to pass both the ground truth image X into the network and extract out fe these features at these different scales. We also pass in the generated image at these different scales. And then now we just apply an L2 loss in this feature space. And then everything else is the same as uh, we had just gone through before. Cool. So. Um, yeah, we just talked about the mo latest, most advanced GAN that enables text-to-image generation. Um, but now we're going to go into a slightly different way that we can use GANs, um, specifically to help improve quantized tokenization. Um, and this is actually a pretty important topic because um, the, this is used as a component in a lot of the more advanced models of today. So if you recall back to the last lecture, we discussed the VQVAE. And with the VQVAE, the goal was to take an image, and then instead of mapping it to some continuous space, we want to map it to some discrete space, uh, lower dimensional discrete space. And the procedure for VQVAE um, did this, um, taking the image, map it through a network, bringing it to some discrete space Z, um, where we assume that we have some uniform prior over um, this discrete codebook. And then after you train this model, um, you can then gen uh, create a generative model over this latent space where you try, try to actually learn the prior over these discrete codes. And this is what you did in homework one. Um, and so the main components of the loss during the codebook learning phase is you have this reconstruction loss to try to recover the original image and then um, this first part of the loss 
tries to learn the code book, and then um, the second part of the loss is what they call the commitment loss. In VQGAN, the, the VQGAN was introduced in this paper called Taming Transformers for High Resolution Image Synthesis. And what the authors noticed is that VQGAN has a lot of the finer details blurred and smoothed out. So um, what they're showing on the right over here of this image of the squirrel is this is the raw image of the squirrel over here. But after you use um, ABQ VAE, um, you can see that a lot of these like textures are smoothed out. For example, like the stone is smoothed out and the fur on the squirrel is no longer really visible. Um, and what they noticed, it, or what, what they hypothesized, is that GANs have been very successful at achieving crisp and realistic print images. So maybe we can somehow leverage GANs to improve the reconstruction quality of, of VQVAE. So here they have three main innovations to, um, VQGAN proposes three main innovations. And yeah, we'll mostly cover the first two, which is how they actually improve the generation. Uh, or, or, or the tokenization. In terms of actually generating images, they uh, also propose this use of a transformer, whereas in the prior works like VQVAE, the original VQVAE and VQVAE2, they were using a pixel CNN. So that also was able to improve their generation performances. Um, but um, yeah, we won't, we won't go into the details of those results. So uh, the perceptual loss is the first thing that they did. They removed the traditional L2 loss and they added the perceptual loss. We briefly talked about the perceptual loss with the GigaGAN upscaling, and they also leveraged that over here. Um, again, it's just like an L2 loss, except now you're taking the L2 loss over features of a, a, a pre-trained VGG network. Um, the more interesting part of VQGAN is the change of the loss function, where they additionally add a GAN loss to it. So. Uh, like just training normal VQVAE, we have our uh, VQVAE objective, which we were looking at earlier, and they introduced this GAN loss over here. The specific GAN that they're using for this model is what they call is, is a patch GAN, which was introduced in an earlier paper. And what patch GAN does is uh, okay. So I guess if we look at if we consider the normal GAN, we just have our input image over here. We pass it through the discriminator, and then we try to predict real or fake. Um, what PatchGAN does instead is we consider individual image patches. So we break this image up into non-overlapping patches, and rather than passing the entire image to the discriminator, we're now just passing all, just each individual patch into the discriminator. The intuition for why that the authors chose to use this GAN as opposed to the prior GANs that we were looking at before is because we already have a really strong reconstruction objective from the VQVAE objective. And again, from the initial motivation, they wanted to improve the lower level, or sorry, the higher frequency details of the reconstructed image. And so the idea here is if we have just the patch scan kind of look at these uh, smaller patches of the image, hopefully we can improve the reconstruction capability of just, or the, or the final level details of just those patches. Um, they use this adaptive weight, um, which Found, which they found to slightly improve performance. Um, and the way that the weight is calculated is you take the last layer of the generator and then you look at the gradient between that and the two losses. And this weight is effectively a ratio between that gradient between these two losses. Um, I'll skip over the architecture, but it's um, pretty standard convolutional architecture with some self-attention block in the middle. And after you train this VQGAN model, you can see that, or actually, yeah, we maybe have a little bit more time so I can briefly talk about the architecture. But yeah, so for the encoder, um, we take in the input image X and then pass it through um, some typical convolution downsampling blocks. This non-local block is the self-attention block, um, which we can only really do at the lower level or the lower resolutions. And then the decoder is um, the exact opposite of that. 
So there's a couple of things here. First, we can see that the higher frequency details are preserved with the DQGAN training procedure. So now again, if we look at this kind of zoomed in version of the squirrel's paws, um, you can see that VQGAN over here is preserving these finer details much more. You can even see like even the textures over here are still preserved. Um, if we look down here at this mushroom, you can see kind of how, that the blades of grass over here are still super crisp. Another advantage of having a more powerful compression algorithm um, like VQGAN is now you can actually compress the image even more to a smaller dimensional latent space. So in VQVAE, they're taking 256 by 256 images and then bringing them down to 32 by 32. And what they show in uh, VQGAN is you can even go compress even further to 16 by 16. And that's what they're showing um, over here. That even if you use a higher compression ratio, you can still maintain really high quality as well as um, and, and preserve a lot of the structure. You can see that the paws are slightly not as good as um, the ground truth, but you're still able to maintain high level structure as well as these lower level fine th these finer lower level details. Um, over here at the bottom, we have a comparison of um, how VQGAN does with some prior work. So VQVA2 is, uh, yeah, just VQVA2, and then DALI, uh, the DALI model is in the original DALI paper, they trained their own discrete VAE. Um, so if you look at the FID for these models, for example, DALI, DALI's v, uh, VAE, the FID is actually quite high. Um, and you can see that the FID is much better for VQGAN, even though we're compressing it a lot more. So it's already much lower. And if we're using the same resolution codes, uh, 32 by 32, the FID on the, on the validation set is much lower. Um, over here, this is the generations that they are able to get if you use, if you then take those pre-trained latent and then train a transformer over it. Again, this is what you all did in homework one. Um, and yeah, they're able to have much nicer generations or yeah, much nicer generations than BQVA2. Uh, I think, yeah, just in the interest of time, I'll probably skip over questions. Um, so now I'll just cover uh, VIT VQGAN. And because of the importance of this tokenization procedure, a lot of people were interested in how to further improve it. And this paper proposes a couple of those improvements um, that make training the VQGAN slightly easier as well as getting better performance. So those um, processes are using, the, the first one that they do is rather than using convolutions, which we were looking at before, they replace the uh, encoder and decoder of the VAE completely with a transformer. Um, and then they also make some modifications to the loss as well as improve the way that the code work is utilized. So first, we can consider the loss function. Um, here they're calling the loss VQ just the VQ components of the loss. Um, and then they have these additional components. We, we maintain the L2 loss that we always had, the reconstruction loss. Um, and then they kind of introduce these additional losses over here. Um, the adversarial loss is the GAN loss, which we saw before. But what they did here is they used the style GAN2 discriminator instead of the patch GAN. And they found that to actually be much better. And we'll, we'll look at those results a bit later. But I think that's pretty interesting because kind of the original intuition for VQGAN was to use this patch GAN to only focus on the lower level details, whereas they found that actually if you just use the more powerful style GAN discriminator over the entire image, uh, you're able to get much better results. Uh, they also introduce this logit Laplace loss over here. So the logit Laplace loss um, looks um, a little funny. But essentially what's happening is 
if you look at the L2 loss or even an L1 loss, that's there's an implicit assumption that you're kind of modeling the, the prediction distribution to be Gaussian, um, where um, the support over the distribution can be um, from negative infinity to positive infinity. But if you think about that, that doesn't really make sense for images because our images are fixed um, pixel values between 0 and 255, or, or 0 and 1 if we're um, subtracting out. And um, this log, so, so this logit distribution was actually proposed in the IGPT paper, and um, they kind of take a modified ver version of the Laplacian distribution um, by introducing this logit over here. Um, and then you essentially get a PDF over zero and one that kind of like looks like this. Um, and just so here's some like kind of visualizations of what the distribution looks like. So you can imagine. And in the original paper where they introduced this in IGPT, the motivation was so that we could get a better um, we could better model how pixels are actually distributed in the real world. And they they apply that here as well, and they find that to be very helpful. So one of the additional tricks that they uh, introduce is a factorized code book. So uh, the vanilla, one of the issues that they found with the original BQBAE and even uh, BQGAN is that many of the latent codes are not actually being used or they're being rarely used. So what they found is that if you introduce a linear projection from the features of your encoder into a lower dimensional into a lower dimensional space, um, you can actually greatly improve the um, greatly improve the codebook utilization. So what that looks like is in the transformer, they are taking um, the features from each of the patches, and then they just linearly project them down to a lower dimensional feature space over here. You can, they linearly project them down. And then they do the codebook lookup in this like lower dimensional feature space. Um, and then to get back the actual um, to get back the actual features, they project back into the feature space of the transformer. So they found that with this, um, the typical VQVAE was using a codebook size of 1024. And uh, with this, they're able to increase the codebook size up by a factor of eight and still maintain really high. Uh, another trick that they employ is using L2 normalization on the encoded latents and the codebook latents. So, um, and, and this is very simple. All they're doing is normal taking um, the features and then normalizing them. And so this just maps everything onto a unit sphere. Um, and yeah, they found that that procedure helped improve um, training stability and reconstruction quality. So yeah, this is some of the results. Um, they try to train models of a few different sizes. They have a small model size, a base model size, and a large size. Um, and then the results over here, they're comparing um, reconstruction quality over these loss metrics, as well as FID and um, inception score. And with the small encoder, small decoder, they're able to get extremely high throughput in terms of um, perform uh, in, in terms of processing images, and get even lower FID and or yeah, get even lower FID than uh, CNN-based architecture. So what they're kind of saying here is that not only does using the transformer help get better performance, but you can actually get much higher throughput. And why they say that this is potentially important is because, let's say you're trying to um, train some type of model, uh, like let's say classification, and you want to use these discrete latent code features. Um, one thing that you could potentially do is just take your entire image data set, pass it through the network, and then use those fixed latent codes. But what a lot of people do in computer vision is you want to apply a lot of data augmentation. And so that usually means you need to keep this um, latent or you need to keep your tokenization encoder around so you can apply augmentations to the input image um, and then get out the codes of those augmented images. Um, at the bottom over here, we are looking at, um, we are looking at 
the performance across different uh, VQVAE methods so that, again, we have the original Dolly discrete VAE and um, the later improved VQGAN. Um, and we can see that they're able to push on that reconstruction FID um, or on that FID metric. So I think the most interesting, uh, this is the ablation study that they do in their paper. And I think the one most relevant here and the one that's probably most interesting is the change in architecture where um, they keep everything the same, but then they're using the patch GAN discriminator. Um, this is their original model is over here. Um, and you can see that there's actually a huge gap in terms of FID that just using the style GAN discriminator um, instead of the patch GAN discriminator lets you drop the FID by half. So yeah, in, in summary, having a better image quantizer with respect, uh, this type of approach lets you get a better image quantizer and is also relatively fast. And why we potentially care about having a better quantizer is because this means we have much less reduction in information from the input. And this is important if we want to be using these downstream equipment for like image understanding, for example. And um, this is actually quite important because a lot of these um, generation methods that we see up today actually leverage pre-trained uh, VQ tokens. And so they'll go through this stage one, stage two approach where you take an, you know, a huge, large, diverse data set, train a VQ GAN on it, onto it to learn these discrete tokens, and then now use these discrete tokens to learn generators. So one um, good example of that is Party, for example. Um, they take images and they use a pre-trained VQ GAN um, to tokenize the images, and then they essentially just train the next token uh, prediction model, auto-aggressive prediction model in this space, uh, very similar to like the multimodal uh, homework question that you all did in homework one. And stable diffusion also does something very similar. They take these uh, input images and then they first map it to a lower dimensional Z space using a pre-trained VQVAE, uh, where this is the encoder and decoder of the VQVAE, and then they apply a generation process, uh, a diffusion generation process, which we'll cover next lecture, in that space. And that enables a lot of what is powering um, the fancy image generation models that we see up today. And yeah, I think that is time. And yeah, is there anything else you wanted to cover? Okay, thank you, Philip. Absolutely, I'm sorry.